says all the different ones, the heat, the redness, the swelling, the pain, the loss of function. And everybody always forgets the loss of function for some reason, but it's up there. And then <clears throat> the second slide had a list of the primary objectives. And the ones with, with the stars you might want to pay extra attention to. Just hint, hint, wink, wink, I guess. So as we go through this, we're actually going to go through part of it this weekend and then the rest of it next weekend. Next week we'll do, um, like, infections. So you need to know the three lines of defense, and it's kind of in this order. It's, the first line of defense is the outside protective covering. So what system is your first line of defense? Skin, the integument carrier system. So that's the first line of defense. If anything gets beyond the integument system, as soon as it penetrates that outer epithelial lining, then you have the second line of defense. The first and the second line are non-specific, which means that if anything gets through there, whether it's a bacteria or a fungus or just a splinter, these two lines of defense have to fight it off. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, if that bacteria gets in, it doesn't matter. It's a bacteria. It doesn't belong in your body. These two lines of defense are going to try to, try to attack it. And then the third line of defense is more specific. This one you've actually had to have exposure to in the past. So... Um, a good example of third line of defense is think about this with the body. Boys, until they're in puberty, what have they not made ever until they get into puberty? Oh, they've made testosterone before birth. Swimmers, right. So they've never made sperm before. All through childhood, their third line of defense is experiencing all this foreign stuff and saying, hey, this is from outside the body. This doesn't belong here. If the testis, if the sperm were exposed... During puberty, what would the body do? If it were exposed to the rest of the body during puberty, what would the body do to it? It'd destroy it. That third line of defense would destroy it because it's never seen it before. So that's from inside the body, but it's actually something you call immunologically privileged. And the testis are one of those places. Anybody remember the other major immunologically privileged part of the body? Think about it. The brain, yeah. So... It's the brain. The actual brain tissue, not the blood, but the brain tissue itself is immunologically privileged. That means your immune system, like your T cells and B cells we'll talk about today and next week, they can't get into the brain tissue. They can go through the blood that flows through the brain, but they can't leave the blood and go in. What's the name of that special barrier that prevents that from happening? The blood-brain barrier. It's so tight that cells can't move across back and forth, including white blood cells. So what's the name of the cell in the brain that, that acts like an immune system and brain tissue? You'll have to know it three weeks. So, microglia. And we'll talk about that. It's not nearly as powerful as the rest of the immune system we're talking about now, but if something gets in your brain, it's there to help kill off the bacteria or the virus. Right. That would be an example of third line of defense, would be something like um, you've had to have exposure to it in the past. So, if sperm gets exposed to the man's body, if sperm somehow moved across the blood barrier, which they call the blood testis barrier, then what would happen to that person? What would they start doing to the sperm in their, their own body? Attacking it. They start killing their own sperm. One of the contraceptive methods they're experimenting with is that they actually could take the husband's sperm and then chop it up into little pieces, expose it to the woman, and then she, her body will actually attack the sperm and kill it. Yeah, which is interesting because that means she can't get pregnant by her husband. By her husband. Right? So... She gets pregnant. She got some splain into it. <laughs> okay. So the first line of defense, and I put the question format up here again to so describe the composition, function, and purpose. And instead of the actual question, question, it's more of the, what's the objective and why are you trying to answer it. So the first line of defense, remember, is the epithelial layer. It's the epithelial outer part. The baby penetrates through that epithelium, the epidermis, then it goes to the second line of defense. But up on the surface of the skin, you, you have the epithelial cells. How many layers is it? Is it one or multiple? It's multiple. Anybody remember the technical type of epithelium it is? It's stratified. Squamous, right. So it's a squash stratified, layer after layer. So you've got like five layers there, but you actually have hundreds of, of layers within those layers. So it's extremely complex. So the bacteria can keep eating out here, and hopefully it's sloughed off before it gets any deeper. <coughs> So the first line of defense is actually having all that thick epithelial tissue. Another part of the first line of defense is everything you secrete on the surface. So when you sweat, sweat has lysozyme in it. Anybody remember that stuff? It's inside of cells and it kills bacteria and it helps digest things in the cells. So your sweat has lysozyme in it. Your sweat also has urea, sodium, potassium, chloride, water, vitamin C. 
It's basically urine. So. When you sweat, you get all that good urine all over the outside of your body. When you take a towel and you just sweat and you rush it over your face, just think about that. But that's full of vices, right? It kills bacteria. Yeah. Uh, when you think of the GI tract, the gastrointestinal lining, it's epithelium too. And it sloughs off about every week, so 7 to 10 days. You rebuild that lining. Now, if you get bacteria in, it's protective. It doesn't go into your actual bloodstream. And the same thing with the respiratory tract. It's all exposed to the outside of the body, so it's protective. And then the biochemical barriers are actually part of the first line of defense, like the lysozyme and antimicrobial. Okay. Um, tears, same idea. Mucus, same idea. Okay, and then the steps of inflammation. Once you break that first barrier, anything that gets beyond this epithelial layer through here, now it's going to stimulate the second line of defense. And the first thing that's going to happen with the second line of defense is you're going to get the inflammatory response. I always look at these mast cells. If you remember the types of cells in the body, and mast cells are the ones that sit in connective tissue. They're not very mobile. So, hey, look. I'll do that. Um, So just under here, you have these little cells. I always think of them as like little landmines. And they're called, looks like, mass and ASP. I don't know why that would back here. The mast cells. And the mast cells are full of two chemicals we'll talk about later, but the one primary chemical is called histamine. And what do you always associate histamine with? I know everybody thinks the first thing. Allergies. You have anything that's foreign to the body that stimulates an immune response or inflammatory response, something like an allergen, once it gets in here, it stimulates those mast cells and they degranulate. They, they push out histamine. And then histamine has a lot of different properties. One thing is it's going to refract white blood cells. It's like, like they call it chafe, bird sharks. It's like the wrong thing. If you watch sharks, you know, I don't. But it attracts them just like sharks and they go on speedy frenzy. The other thing it does is it causes the blood vessels to open up and those endothelial cells to retract so you get more leakage. If the fluid is like a plasma going to leak out in the tissue, what's going to happen in the tissue? Do you remember that term for the fluid leaking into the tissue? Edema. Yes, yeah, so you get a little edema spot. It swells it up. It gets red because you're increasing blood fluid in the area. It gets warm because of that hot blood. So the swelling, the inflammation, the redness. And then if it's too big, then you get the loss of function. So if you get a joint that swells up gigantic, you can't move it very well. That would be the loss of function. <laughs> And then we can explain all the stuff happening in three easy steps. On the next slide. So here we go. The first thing that happens is that the mast cells degranulate. MST, I mean ST cells degranulate. And here's an example of them. So degranulate, like, what's it dumping in the environment? Histamine. The second thing is you get something called endothelial retraction. What is endothelium? It's a fancy word for epithelium on what structures? Blood vessels. So you get this endothelial retraction. They're nice and tight up here, but what happens when histamine hits it is that they'll start pulling apart. They start spreading out like that. So this, the cells with my fingers, and they're somewhat tight before, now suddenly they're going to pull apart. What's going to happen when you have those big gaps? Leakage, right? So the third step is that fluids leak. And what are you trying to attract to the area? So the endothelial retraction opens up, increases the blood flow. It also allows step three, which is leakage, which is swelling. And what did I tell you was going to be attracted at sharks? White blood cells. And so it attracts those two factors into the area. Things like white blood cells. So those are the three main steps. Right. When you bring those fluids into the area, we call those exudates. They can be different types of fluids. The first one is serous exudate, and it's clear. It's clear plasma. Usually when you see fluid accumulating in any compartment of the body, it's typically filtered plasma, and that's all this is. So serous exudate is watery. The best example of this is when you get a sunburn, 
and that epithelial layer starts pulling up and off of the dermis, so the epidermis starts separating from the, the dermis, you get that clear fluid that's inside, that serous exudate. And if you pop it, it leaks out clear. <clears throat> if it comes out white and like frothy, what is it? It's not water anymore. Why is it not water? What must have gotten in there? Bacteria. bacteria. And what happens is your white blood cells come in and they start attacking the bacteria. And it's like a, going to a buffet and eating until you burst. The white blood cells come in, they keep eating bacteria, eating bacteria until it's burst. And that's called purulent. What's the layperson name for purulent exudate? Pus. Not pus. So, when you see purulent, you know that it indicates infection. Cirrus, did you get an infection by the sun? No, you damaged the tissue, but nothing actually infected, so it's clear. When a bacteria gets in there, that's why your mom says, don't pick it, leave it alone, because then you know you do it every time. Because she doesn't want the bacteria getting in there. Because if bacteria gets in, then it could get infected, then it will start turning white, which is purulent. And the next one, fibrinous exudate. Fibrinous means it's dense. Basically, it's, it's like clumping. It's dense, yeah, thick. So it typically looks white, just like purulent, but it's more thick. It's almost like when you pop a pimple and you've got that thick substance there. You all, you laugh, but you all know what I'm talking about. Right? <laughs> there isn't one of you who's immune to acne, or was. So it's more thick and dense, almost like the lumps in Tyler's teeth. So, usually purulence indicates the first stages of infection. Fibrinous usually indicates the later infection. It's been there for a while. And the fourth <coughs> hemorrhagic, bless you. What's hemorrhagic telling you? It's bleeding. Yeah, there's blood in it. So, like, when you pop that pimple and that thick stuff comes out, after that, it keeps squeezing, eventually it starts bleeding. And then you get, like, this clear, with blood fluid that comes out. Indicates bleeding. Okay, next point was to define inflammation, st stating the major benefits of the process. The major point of inflammation, well, number one is hopefully inflammation is localized. But what's the whole point? What's it trying to do? Think about it. We'll go back to that picture real quick. With this inflammation, what's it trying to do? You had some kind of effector that got into the tissue over here and stimulated this mast cell to degranulate. What's the mast cell trying to do? Mm -hmm. Open the blood vessels to bring what into the area? Blood cells, and it's trying to do what? Prevent prevent the infection from getting further. Yep. So it's trying to stop the infection. It's almost like the infection is moving, 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 and then you call in the cavalry to pull this line up so that it can't get back through there. I guess if I played football, it would be the same as trying to get the like, past the other team kind of idea. Yeah, my football analogies need some work. Okay. So initiated by, and it's typically an infection. So if something gets in from the, from the outside. You can also put inflammation, even if it's not an infection, like UV light. Remember, UV actually damages the tissue. Unfortunately, depriving the tissue of nutrients can do the same thing. The tissue is starting to build up toxins. What are those little oxidative stressor things? What do they call them? Free radicals. Yeah, so free radicals can do it too. When you deprive the nutrients, the mitochondria requires the cell itself can keep the equilibrium on those bases, and then it starts releasing free radicals to cause a lot of problems. Um, it can be smashing the tissue, so not just UV, but it can actually be physical damage. It can be temperature, like cooking the tissue or freezing the tissue. So any of those different things can cause inflammation. And then you can see the benefits. Once the destruction isolates whatever the effective agent is, and it starts the healing process too. Right. So by the time we're done with inflammation and immunity, you should understand each of these different cells. These are the specialized cells we're going to talk about um, all today and the next as we're going through and looking at the different ones, some of these you already know, like a macrophage. What's the whole point of a macrophage? You eat things, right? Big eaters, so you eat things like bacteria. Exactly. Maybe you've heard of B cells and T cells. We'll talk about that later. Um, mast cells should be up there somewhere on the top. What do you know they release? 
So we're talking about a few chemicals, but right now you should automatically think histamine. So when we look at the lines of defense, you have this non-specific line of defense, and all of these things, they don't care what got in your body. A macrophage doesn't care if it's a bacteria or not. If it's not supposed to be there, it will be good. Over here, these are specific, which means what you had to have prior experience with it. Yeah. So the B cells and the T cells are because of things you've exposed, been exposed to before. So we'll talk about things like when you get a, um, a vaccination or something. It's the B and T cells that you're actually stimulating the vaccine. You're getting prior expo exposure to something that looks like the mumps or a piece of the mumps so that when your body sees it later, it can attack it right away. Okay, so the next objective was knowing the cell mediators of inflammation, and we've already talked a little bit about the mast cells, but when you look at the names of the different cells, you can go to granulocytes and adranulocytes. And the granulocytes, the major ones you want to know are the neutrophils, the eosinophils, the basophils, remember the granulocytes? I don't think I put all of them up there. I just put granulocytes and neutrophils for the first one. This is not in there? Hmm. What came next in your notes? Oh, yeah, that's the next slide. Sorry. I don't know how that one got out of order then. I may have taken it out. Do you, you said you don't see it at all? Mm, it's slightly different. Okay. So what you want to know from this is, when we're going to go through these two, the granulocytes, you want to remember the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And if you remember from your physiology or an anatomy class, the neutrophils, they're the most abundant. They're the first on the scene of any infection. So as soon as something gets through that epithelial layer, then they're there. They're quick. If you take a microbiology class, usually what they'll tell you to remember also is that if you take a sample of the tissue and you see lots of neutrophils, it means this early infection. They're the first on the scene. When you see eosinophils, eosinophils you want to associate with things like parasitic invasion or oh, allergies. And the basophils are exactly like the mast cells except they're in your blood. Mast cells are like landmines. They're sitting right underneath the skin, just waiting. Anything that stimulates them, they decranulate. We're going to talk about it the next time. A basophil is just like it, but it's flowing through your, your blood. So if something gets into the blood and it bumps into that mast cell, it releases histamine. So if you took a, if somebody came in feeling really sick and you took a blood sample and you see a high level of neutrophils, what would you predict? They have an early infection. What if you saw a high level of eosinophils and a high level of basophils? What would you predict? Well, what do you think with the basophils? What chemical? Histamine. And I told you with the eosinophils, it's allergies and parasites. So if you saw a high, or high basophil and high eosinophil, you could almost assume allergies. What if it were just high eosinophils and not high mast cells? Probably a parasitic invasion. Yep. So knowing what these things are is always good to and then monocytes, they turn into macrophages. Monocytes don't have to turn just into a macrophage, they turn into a specialized macrophage. Like when we talk about um, the liver, we'll talk about cut for cells. They're a macrophage. When we talk about um, the lungs, we'll talk about the alveolar macrophage. They're a macrophage, but they're specialized to a tissue. But they're, they start as monocytes. This is interesting, too. When you talk about bone, anybody know what monocytes become on the bone? Osteo... Class, because what do osteoclasts do? They eat the bone. Yeah, they eat the bone. They destroy the bone. Some things run up kind of flashbacks. And then the lymphocytes, we'll talk about those like natural killer cells. We'll also talk about the B and T cells. And this is primarily a preview slide. But this, I think, is not in the But these little things are called prolite receptors. We'll talk about these. Last week we were talking about cancer cells, and cancer cells have that, those little, what do they call those things on the surface that identify a cancer cell? Tumor markers, right? So the markers, these little pattern recognition markers are the same idea. They're little markers that give some kind of an idea of the immune system, like, hey, this might not belong here. And we'll talk about these things like toll-like receptors. And they call them toll-like receptors for a reason you don't need to know, but they identify anything that's on a bacteria-like cell. 
we've evolved with these. And they think that since bacteria have in common these special type of proteins or glycoproteins on the surface, these full like receptors identify that type of glycoprotein in almost every bacteria. That way, do you have to have experience with that bacteria before? Nope, because if it's a bacteria, it probably has it, and these receptors actually detect it. And it's kind of interesting because they think this is the oldest part of our immune system. It's so primitive that as long as we've been exposed to bacteria, we've been developing these things to protect us from it. We'll talk about these, though. Complement receptors through complement cascade. Little tiny proteins that float through your blood that trigger immune response. Or actually participating in the immune response. And then these are kind of specialized. These just detect negative charges that are on bacteria, too. Called scavenger receptors. This, you have to know. So this is the mast cell. And what's the first chemical that should come to your mind? Histamine. Okay. So this mast cell has all these little granules all over it. And it actually has more than just histamine. But histamine is the key one you want to remember. So what happens is, this is like a landmine sitting under the tissue. As soon as something breaks through it, it doesn't matter if it's a splinter, or if it's bacteria, or if it's anything. As soon as you cut through it, it stimulates this mast cell to degranulate. It's like the, the landmine explodes. It doesn't kill the cell, but it releases all this chemical all over the place. And then when it degranulates, the first thing you think of is histamine. And this histamine is a vasoactive substance. It causes those blood vessels to open up, increase blood flow, to make it red, to make it swollen, to bring the other immune factors in. And the other type of chemical is called a chemotactic factor. Chemotactic is kind of a tricky word. It just means chemical attractive. And how this works is that if you release a chemotactic factor, wherever it's the most concentrated at is the source of the problem. As it diffuses out, it gets thinner and thinner. But almost all living organisms can detect chemicals in their environment and can detect concentrations of the chemicals. Like, your cells in your body, your white blood cells, they don't have a nose, they don't have eyes, they don't have ears. They smell by these chemicals. And what they'll do is as they're cruising along, if they smell one chemical, you go, and they, they turn their, themselves towards wherever the concentration is at. So if they smell one here, and they go this way, and they're 10, and over here there's zero, what do they know? It must be in the direction of the 10, right? And then they start moving towards the 10, and they keep sniffing back and forth, basically, and kind of working with sniffing. But they keep smelling where the highest concentration is, and they move in that direction. It's like a bloodhound. When a bloodhound runs over a path, like a, where a rabbit's been, It'll look one way and it'll look the other. What's it looking for? Or smelling for, actually. Where the path is the freshest, right? So if the rabbit ran this way from, well, for you, let's say it ran from the right over to the left, where's it going to be the freshest? On the left. So it'll smell, and where the freshest chemicals are, where they're most dense, will be over here, and it knows to go that way. And it keeps smelling back and forth. Rubbing its nose back and forth, smelling where the highest concentration is, and just keeps following and following. That's what cells in your body do, and that's called chemotaxis. Um, I'll have a video later that shows a, a, a macrophage looking for a piece of bacteria. It's amazing watching this thing chase the bacteria. Bacteria wobbles all over, and it leaves this little chemical trail behind it, and the white blood cell will just keep weaving back and forth right after it. So when I release this chemotactic factor, what's it trying to do? I break the skin, bacteria gets in, it releases histamine for the inflammatory response. They're also releasing the chemotactic factor trying to what? Attract white blood cells. In fact, it attracts two types of white blood cells right away, neutrophils and eosinophils. Which ones are the first ones on the scene all the time? Neutrophils. They're the most abundant in the body. They're all over the place. So as soon as you release this neutrophil chemotactic factor, the neutrophils come right in, right away. And then the eosinophils, I like to think of the eosinophils being the second one. They're not the most abundant, but why would you want those in right away just in case? What are they there for? Well, allergies, but but if it's something that's huge, like a what? A parasite, you want them in there right away. Because the eosinophils know how to deal with parasites better than a neutrophil does. A neutrophil is for everything, but the eosinophil, man, if this is a big creature, you want to kill that thing as fast as possible. And that's how I was always remember those are the first two chemicals that are released for chemotaxis. So you want to remember that the mast cells, what they release, they release histamine, and they release that chemotactic factor for neutrophils and eosinophils. Right. That's the first stage. So the first stage of activation is this degranulating. 
After that, they're not done. They're worried. They're like, oh man, you know what? That wasn't good enough. So then they start cranking up other chemicals. So they degranulate right away, but then they start synthesizing other products. When they start synthesizing, this is one that's really important. You make this stuff called arachidonic acid, and that arachidonic acid makes things called prostaglandins. Has anybody ever heard of that? They cause pain. Yeah, they stimulate pain. What's interesting is if you take aspirin, aspirin stops this step right here. If you shut off this step so it starts producing processes and it stops this, what do you know about the pain response? It stops prostaglandins from forming and stops the pain. So aspirin works by stopping this pathway. You get that initial chemotactic attraction, but you don't get the secondary effects of the pain. Look at the other effects. If it's stopping this pathway, look at this part of the pathway. Platelet activation, what else does aspirin do? Prevents clotting. Exactly. So when you think of aspirin down the road or whenever you have to deal with it, now you know exactly how it's working. It goes to where these mast cells are trying to stimulate blood clots and where they're trying to stimulate pain, and it stops this pathway from working. It shuts it off. Uh, the third thing it does here are leukotrienes, and we'll bring these up again later. But leukotrienes help stimulate fever. So what else does aspirin do? Produce a fever. So it helps prevent fever in the first place. How many people already knew that stuff? Good. Yay, you learned something new today. Let's go home then. Mm -hmm. Kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, so the main step, remember, was releasing the chemicals it had stored up. The second step was the synthesizing, the neutrophil, or the, um, the pain, the prostaglandins. It helps stimulate platelets for clotting. <coughs> And the leukotrienes. Leukotrienes are chemicals that talk to leukocytes. But if they get in your blood, they'll go up to your, what temperature regulator in your head are they going for? The hypothalamus. Yeah, they shoot for the hypothalamus and they stimulate fever pain. Okay. And I already talked about this on the last slide. This means you feel in the conflict of more active factors. Okay. And then there's the synthesis. So leukotrienes, remember with leukotrienes, what they would try to do is they try to stimulate white blood cells coming into the area, and they also try to stimulate that fever, which we'll get to later. And then prostaglandins try and create pain. Another thing that prostaglandins do is they cause smooth muscle retraction, retraction squeezing down the smooth muscle. What they're trying to do is they go downstream of histamine. This means opening up the capillaries, but the prostaglandins are pinching off the smooth muscle around the blood vessels downstream. Why? To prevent prevent bacteria from moving. So if you look down here, remember the blood flowing this way, going downstream. If the prostaglandins are loose, they come downstream. They're not going to go up here. So are they going to affect this blood vessel? No, nope, they're not going to affect this one. So the blood keeps going to the area, but as it's flowing downstream, they cause this area to squeeze. Why? They're trying to block up the flow, slow the flow through here so that the bacteria can't spread and also give you a chance for the white blood cells to spread. It's kind of a cool process. And the third one, the platelet activating factor, it's helping to clot things up. Okay, and your next one talks about these three systems, right? Your next slide? Okay, I think everything should be in the same thing. So identify the three plasma protein systems that mediate inflammatory response. And there are some details I put in the slide, but I'll tell you exactly what you need to know. You need to know the three. The first one's called complement. Complement's there because it's important for attacking bacteria and triggering immune response. So this complement stuff will actually directly attack bacteria. It'll also stimulate or turn up your immune system. The second one, I think you can probably figure out, but the coagulation system, what's it there for? Clotting blood, yep. And the third one, the kinin system, has a lot of responses, but it, part of its response is a pain response. So if you get an infection or you get some kind of cut here, what would be the benefit of pain in that area? Pain's not increasing the rate of healing, but what's it keeping you from healing? 
exposing it to other things that could potentially be bacteria, other things that can affect. So those are the three main systems. All three of these systems, they they start with inactive enzymes. They call them proenzymes. And all three of the systems have what they also call a cascade effect. So when you look at proenzymes, they're already in your system. They're right there. You have blood clotting factors that are flowing through right now, they're not doing anything. They're proenzymes, which is before the actual enzyme. They're like dominoes. So you have this row of dominoes. They're all in place. All it takes is to flip the first trigger, and then you know that each of them is going to turn on the next one. And it's not that they just one turns on one, it's that one turns on two, and those two turn on four, and those four turn on eight, and the sixteen and thirty-two, and it just keeps increasing. And that's why I put the picture of the snowball, is because at the top of the hill you start with a small snowball, and as you get to the bottom of the hill, what happens to it? It's huge, right? That's the idea of the cascading effect. All it takes is a little initial trigger, and then the effect gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So complement turns up the immune system, the coagulations for blood clotting, and then kind of primarily with things like pain, and it also is important for blood vessel response too. And I put a couple examples here. So the complement you'll actually have to know because this is the inflammatory and infection area. But when you look at this, it's kind of interesting. And you're not going to have to memorize this. Maybe microbiology will have to memorize it, but not this class. When you look at this pathway for a complement, the complement, there are actually three types of complement pathways. So you have the classical, you have the selection, you have the alternative. But if you look at all three of them, they have different initiating triggers, but look what happens to the pathway. So, here you have all these little factors, these dominoes are in place, we know what happens with all three of those. They all merge into the same pathway. So, they all have the same final response, they just have a different initiating trigger. So, when you flip one on, it goes and down into that common pathway. Put a different one on, same thing, until the common pathway. And the same thing with this one. So, they all end in the common pathway. What you want to remember for this class is. Well, with the classical, they start with a chemical called C1. Until it gets on the C3, it has kind of a unique pathway. And you don't have to remember C1, C4, C2, C3. That's the unique thing. Unless you go into being an immunologist, then you don't. Really but this middle one here, C3, is super important. Because look at all three pathways. What's the C3 have? It's where they all merge, where they all come together. So what if you were born with a C3 deficiency? What's that tell you about your... All three of these are going to what? If you're missing this, they all fail. None of them will work, right? So you can't use this pathway if you're missing C3. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about genetic diseases that are revolved around the immune system, like skin. Bubble boy. They don't have this pathway right here, so they can't turn any of these on. So C3 is the first thing you want to remember. The next thing is the final step for these. This is really cool. They call it the MAC. It stands for Membrane Attack Complex. If this is a bacteria down here, and I trigger one of these pathways, if the final goal is to find that bacteria, and it will actually plug little pins into it. So I get this water bloom-like bacteria, and now I plug this hole, or I punch this little hole inside, what's going to happen to the bacteria? It leaks, right? So it shrivels up. <coughs> this membrane attack complex leaks for the membrane of the bacteria, it punches a hole in it, until it forms a hole, a hole, a hole, hole, a W-H-O-L-E, H-O-L-E. And then it starts leaking. It basically pops the bacteria as if it were a water balloon. So C3 is the common one, and then the final product is called an MAC, or Membrane Attack Complex. And then we'll talk about these when we need them. You can see the different pathways again. And I put this one slide that talks about where the most significant. So, in any means you were born with it, adaptive means that you learn to use it. So where do you think you'll typically see the NA? First, second, or third line of defense? First or second? Where do you think you're typically going to see the adaptive? In a third line of defense, one that's specific, one that you've had to have experience in the past. 
And then I just think this thing's kind of cool, so I found a couple of pictures that show you how it works. It just changes. Here's whatever it is that's trying to affect you. It triggers this pathway. All the dominoes start falling into place. And then there's the bacteria that comes to the hole in the bacteria. Lysis is the The first two. And you can see, it looks like lady fingers right here on the ceiling. It's hungry. So I can't do that. It makes this nice round hole, pokes a hole in the middle of the membrane, and that's what we got. And then, when this happens, all of these pieces have purposes. Like chemotaxis, what they're trying to do, in addition to poking a hole in it, what else are they trying to do? Chemotaxis. Attract like blood cells, yep. So if this pathway gets turned on, some of these little fragments are actually working to attract like blood cells, bring them into the area. It triggers an inflammatory response. Some of these will trigger a mass cell for these And then we'll talk about optimization later. Optimization is basically if it can't kill the bacteria, it acts like a chain and shackle. So it'll grab a hold and hold on to it for dear life and hold it until something else can kill it. It's like that woman in Walmart with like five kids hanging off her leg and it takes her five minutes to get up to them. Check out. The kids didn't kill her, but she wishes she was dead. Right? <laughs> Something like that. But this complement, if it can't kill the bacteria directly, well, think about parasites. A parasite's a multicellular organism. Is poking one hole in one cell going to make a big difference? No, not really. So what happens is this cotton will start coating. It sticks all over the parasite to try and slow it down a little bit and also attract white blood cells to the area. It's like holding on to it, but slowing it down a little. We'll talk about that again later. There's a whole slide dedicated to opsonizing. All right, and then I already talked about these. So coagulation, you want to think of the clotting. Don't, you don't have to memorize this. I'm just showing you that whole domino effect again. You trigger one step and then all the way down to the end. Think about these pathways. They're a pathway, a chain of dominoes. What happens if I spend three hours setting my whole row of dominoes and then somebody comes along and steals that one? What just happened? Or to make it even worse, this is what my little brother would have done to me. Right? You watch the whole chain reaction happen, but before you can actually turn on like something like the membrane attack complex, what just happened? I stopped it. Yeah, you pull that one out and you don't get the final result. What would happen if this coagulation cascade, what if I pulled out this letter right here? On, 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 but I never did a clot. What do you call that disease? Hemophilia. Yeah. So there are several types of hemophilia, and they revolve around missing some of these little dominoes in the pathway. And then the kinin system, I didn't put the pathway up here, but basically, like I said before, it's to trigger pain, it's to trigger, turn on, um, more inflammatory response. Okay, and then here are the different cells. I put this picture up here because when you look at the neutrophils, the eosinophils, the basophils, the monocytes, anybody know where they're made? Mm -hmm. All of them are made in the bone marrow. So, there are all types of blood cells. It doesn't matter if you're talking about red blood cell or white blood cells. They're all made in the bone marrow. And they all come from the same stem cell. So, a hemocytoblast makes all of the blood cells. And you see all the branches coming out. You stimulate it with one chemical. It starts going over here to become a pro-erythroblast. What's pro mean? Precursor. Erythro is meaning the red blood cell. And blast means maker. So, it tells you it turns on this pathway. This is a before red blood cell maker, then it becomes a red blood cell maker, then it becomes a normal blast of a particular site in the nervous system. And depending on who you've had for physiology, yet, I told you you need to remember what a reticulocyte was, right? because it's really when you take a blood sample. If somebody has a higher normal number of reticulocytes, it's because they start turning this pathway on really heavy. What probably happened to them is they would need to turn on this pathway really fast. Mm -hmm. They have bleeding somewhere, right? And it's around the surface, it must be internal. When you see a lot of these reticular sites, it means the losing goes in the macro places. The same thing would happen over here. What if I had tons and tons of, well, we'll go for the neutrophils. I have way more neutrophils than normal. What's probably going on? They have an infection, and they're sending signals back to say, hey, we need to make more neutrophils to crank it up. Or asanophils, and they probably have a parasite. 
So if you take a blood sample out, you can see these pathways. This is the sucky part. If this is my main resource, and it's committed to making 100, let's say this one cell makes 100 new cells a day, but it has to divide its resources among all of these, if I start cranking up the white blood cells, what has to happen to the red blood cell production? It drops down. What if I start cranking up the red blood cell, what happens to the white blood cell production? It drops down. So when somebody that has something like leukemia, what's going on with them? They're making too many white blood cells. They're not good white blood cells, so they're not really healthy. But what's the common thing that happens when somebody has leukemia? What's a the, the symptom? They, mm -hmm. they get uneven too because they're focusing on making so many white blood cells that the red blood cell production slows down. So these are all coming from the same source, and it's kind of I want to put, put that in perspective. All right, monocytes. They become what? Yep, cells that eat other cells. Monocytes are the inactive version. They go to wherever they need to be, and then they're activated. When they're activated, if they're going through the bloodstream, they can move into any tissue, reach in there, they can call them a macrophage. They're big here, this giant cell that's just waiting to eat anything. If they're tissue specific, so if they're a tissue specific macrophage, we usually give them a special name, like cuffer cells. You remember where I told you cuffer cells were? In the liver. Yeah. So they eat bacteria that gets into the liver, primarily. Microglia, do you know where they are? In the brain. I'll be able to probably figure that one out. The lungs, yeah. So you have these specialized monocytes in different organs for specialized purposes. Put a macrophage in an active version of a monocyte. The monocytes get precursor. Okay. And the next thing that your book, the book wants you to do is explain the process of how the phagocytes activated. So phagocytosis is the process of eating things. And when you look at the different steps, the first thing you're going to do is you actually have this monocyte traveling through the blood. And then when it detects chemicals, like, for instance, histamine, it goes, and now it's like a bloodhound. If histamine is present, what happens to these endothelial cells? They retract, they open up, right? Like the gap of here. What happens in the smooth muscle downstream? It starts tracking, it starts pinching this off. So now these white blood cells, they start slowing down. As they're slowing their flow down, and they start rolling along, they call they call cave fencing, margination. I have a very creative imagination. I always imagine these things rolling, and it's like the mutters on a big truck. You can hear them rolling along really slow until they come to a stop. They're getting really good traction, and they're rolling along the blood cell until they can finally slide in. That process of squeezing through and getting into the tissue, out of the blood and into the tissue, is called diaphoresis. So they slow down, they stick to the walls of the blood vessel, and then they pull themselves into the tissue. We'll say that this is the epidermis here. The epidermis, and then you've got the dermis. They pull themselves in, and then they start smelling. They're moving by what process? There's more infection over here, more infection over here. Chemotaxis. Yep, so they start moving by chemotaxis down to this area until they find wherever that main source is at. And then they look for it. It's bacteria. They attack it. They get the splinter. They attack it. They look for whatever that problem is and it starts happening. So the process of turning on is that you stimulate the histamine or you stimulate that chemotaxis factor. And this doesn't have to be a max phase. This can also be a neutral phase. It starts slowing down and it moves in, penetrates in, and it starts to move by human axis to wherever that effective agent is. That's the first steps. And then when it grabs a hold of whatever it is, you can see the bacteria up here. I can use this so it shows up. There we go. So you can see the little bacteria. Here's your white blood cell. It goes over the bacteria, it grabs the bacteria, and then it wraps itself around. It doesn't break the membrane, because this is like a water balloon. If you break that membrane, what happens? It's dead, right? It's going to burst. It lyses. So it wraps itself completely around. Just engulfs, is the word they use. It engulfs the bacteria. And then it pinches together, almost like a ball of like pizza dough or bread dough. You can spin it into this long structure, you can loop back around, and it's continuous, and then you make it merge together again, like it wasn't broken in the first place. So it just merges around here and merges back together. Now you have this bacteria that's completely encapsulated. It's inside of a vesicle, it's trapped in a membrane, it's floating through the microphase. 
As it's growing through the macrophage, then you have these little lysosomes that fly up through it. What's the purpose of the lysosome? Digestion. And then they merge and they dump their stomach contents on top of the bacteria and they chew the bacteria out. They process the bacteria. The cell can actually keep the good stuff, like if it needs some protein, now it has lunch. So it's like the stomach in there. So it has food and foods get lunch. So it's digesting it, and then this, just like you, processes the food and gets rid of the waste product and keeps the good stuff. And that's the process of phagocytosis, or phagocytosis. So it eats it, swallows it, processes it, and then spits out the debris. It's actually even cooler than this. Um, I love, I love the immune system. I thought it was really cool because I animorphed everything. These things are like headhunters. They find the bacteria, they kill the bacteria, they eat the bacteria, but the headhunters always like a trophy. So they take the head and they put it on a stake and they parade around town with it, right? These macrophages, when they kill something like a bacteria, they'll take a piece of the bacteria, they put it on a stake and they put it up on their surface. Then they parade around your body with it, telling other white blood cells, hey, look what I feel, it's delicious. <laughs> And that's what they do. It's exactly like that. And we'll talk about that process, too. But in general, phagocytosis, anything that eats another cell is phagocytosis. Okay. Next chemicals to be familiar with are called cytokines. So these kind things are chemicals. A cytokine just says it's a fancy cell chemical. There are lots of them, but in general, I'm not going to make you remember any of the like, details, just in general what they are. So, cytokines, we usually refer to them as interleukins. Inter means what? Between, right? Intra means within. Inter means between, like interstitial is a space between. And then leukins, guess what they're talking about? Between what? White blood cells. These are chemicals that one white blood cell talks to another. So, interleukins are white blood cell communicators. They're primarily released by macrophages, which is the white blood cell, and those things called lymphocytes, the BNT cells. So a bacteria comes along, your macrophage sees this thing, it eats it, and starts releasing interleukins all over the neighborhood. It says, hey, there's food in this area. It's like passing off pamphlets to other white blood cells. And when they abbreviate them, they call them IL. look at this. I have one, I have two, I have four, I have five. I think there are 15 all together. I know there are at least 13, but I think there are up to 15 now. You don't have to remember those. They do so many different things, but in general, you need to know what do they do in general. Interleukins are chemicals that white blood cells release to talk to white blood cells. And you can see even mast cells, mesonophils, mesonophils, leukocytes, natural killer cells. They're all white blood cells. So the second one's are tumor necrosis factor, and originally they called them tumor necrosis factors because they would stimulate tumors to become, what's necrosis mean? Dead. Yep. So they're stimulated to release chemicals. Macrophages are the ones that release TNF. And that's how they breathe it, TNF. Macrophages release that. And the one key thing you want to remember with TNF is it triggers fever. So they call it a pyrogen. What's it mean by pyrogen? Pyro, fire, gen, generator, exactly. It creates heat. How does it create heat? What's it do to you? What's that heat? It makes you cause, cause you to have a fever. Yeah. So it's another one of those chemicals that goes up to the brain, triggers like an epidemic, and say, hey, you got something bad in here, let's kill it. And then the last one, interferon. Interferon's primary purpose is because of viral infection. So cells that are infected by a virus release interferon to tell other cells, hey, there's a virus in the neighborhood, lock the doors, bar the windows, don't let it in. So it slows movement of an infection, a viral infection specifically. So it slows viral infection. So a lot of times when people go to do chemotherapeutics, chemotherapy decreases the number of white blood cells, so they mix interferon at the same time to prevent what from traveling from the body. 
virus. Yeah, so if they get a virus, like they get the flu and they have interferon, it's turning up the defense of most of those cells in their body trying to help their immune system. And then cytokines enhance the inflammatory response because they activate other white blood cells. And here's how the interferon works. Let's say I get a virus. Here's my first step. The virus creeps in, the cell detects the virus, and says, holy crap, I'm infected. There's not much I can do. So it'll send out this little ear interferon molecule and goes over to the neighbor and tells the neighbor there's a virus in the neighborhood. So now this cell diverts its resources and says, okay, normally I would be doing this job, but I'm going to turn down that normal job and I'm going to start making this antiviral stuff. So that way if the virus comes along and I've got the antiviral, it'll attack it and destroy it. So this cell is already screwed, right? It's going to die. Well, how is it going to die? Huh? Yeah, so the, the virus is in it, but this cell says, I'm going to die anyway, so I'm going to kill myself. What's the opposite? Apoptosis, yeah. They'll try to apoptosis, and it'll actually put flags on its surface that say, eat me. So the other white blood cells say, oh, sorry, buddy, and then they'll just go and digest them. Or whatever, I don't be sexist. So that's how interferon works. Okay. And actually, it's 2 o'clock. We can take a break and we'll come back with the local versus <laughs> systemic responses. Interferon also released by Interferon is released by anything virally infected. Any, oh, it's released yep. by the Whatever the infected cell is. Infected cell is. Yep, it so can be. Interferon can just be in cells. Yep. It can be uh, a you know, muscle cell, it can be a skin cell, it can be a head cell. It is, what is a pain, some kind of delusion is in a cell already. Yep. Yeah, it has the genetics for it. Did we forget that I had the body?